has car insurance. You can switch over. able to sneak out a little bit early, but the last talk was one that I wanted to see because it's a colleague of mine, so, um, and it ends right at 5 o'clock, so um, I will basically try to find a quiet room on the side and, um, and get on Skype and answer any questions. Um, Thursday, I'm not quite sure. I would try to be able to do the same thing should be at the airport on Thursday at about this time. So um, I will let you know the time on Thursday. So when you do meet on Tuesday, um, if at least one person could bring um, a computer that you guys can Skype with. My Skype name is Eggplant on Ice. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's up here. Sorry, I know it's a weird one, but it's my nickname. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> um, I think I do have a, I, I made one point, I made a more formal, just Aaron Pettit one that um, was for having more formal interactions. But most of my friends have this one, so this one's the one I yeah, I, I have my formal Skype and then my Skype I use with my friends. Yeah. You should at least want to eat the next plant on the ice to <laughs> fit the I have. Well, okay, I okay, like, so I'm you did that. On ice. Okay. And actually there's a great picture of me somewhere <laughs> with an eggplant that they sent out to our to our camp. <laughs> so okay. it's like me holding this eggplant up. Yeah, it was pretty funny. Um yeah, it's been nicknamed the sense for twelve years now or something. Um, okay, and then so so yeah, what we're going to do today is take the conservation of momentum, what we sort of came down to at the end. Um, most of these are going to be slow flowing fluids, so we actually are going to always assume that acceleration terms go to zero. Um, and we're, I want to kind of run through some different examples. I don't know that we'll get to all of them today. There's some of these are also in your notes. There's also some slight variations in your notes. And then there's two more, slightly more complicated ones um, that are in the notes. And there are, um, I think both of those are in the notes, but there is, um, <laughs> There are two videos that I put together last year with me going through them on the iPad, and those are, are linked within that, those calendar days there. So, um, um, so these are, the idea here is just to give you guys some practice of how to think through what assumptions can we make, what assumptions can we not make right away, what, what are the effects of a different assumption? Um, because you could have the same system, and then depending on whether you choose assumption A or <coughs> assumption B, you'll get a different answer. And um, Neely was asking earlier about how do you know when to make assumptions. In the real world, when you're actually really solving problems like this, it does sometimes come down to your judgment. And as you get to know a system, um, as a scientist, you'll start to know whether or not is it justifiable for me to assume that there's a sliding boundary on this, or what, what are the limitations based on past research? What have other people done in terms of this particular assumption? And do I agree with what everyone else has done, or do I want to say, no, I don't agree with this assumption, I'm going to take this different assumption? Um, and hope we'll try to talk a little bit about what you can use to justify different <coughs> assumptions um, in, in different situations. So, um, 
the first one, um, I want to kind of walk through together. And what I did on these, so if you remember on, on this, this version of the equation, these three equations that are on all of those pieces of paper, um, or on most of them, um, this is already written out assuming no acceleration. So this is what we ended with on um, Tuesday is uh, this version where we have the derivatives of the stress plus some force is equal to zero. So initially we're starting here with just the assumption that um, that there's no acceleration. That doesn't mean that there's not flow or movement. All it means is that the flow is slow enough that the acceleration term is going to be very small compared to these, the stress terms, the stress frequency. Is that F? That, does it have an I or a J? It's a J. Uh, no, it should be an I, sorry. So, so connecting this to what's on the paper in front of you, if you guys have had a chance to read through the notes, you probably will see this. We do have two eyes here, but they're in different terms. So we don't sum over those eyes. There are j's here in the same term, which means we sum over them. And that's how we end up with this d sigma 1, 1, dx1 plus d d sigma 1, 2, dx2 plus d sigma 1, 3, dx3 plus f in the one direction equals zero. So this is saying that the body force is in the same direction as our, the direction of the normal, which is also related to the the sigmas that we're working with here, or the, the shear forces that we're working to, is one of, it's the plane that the shear force, or the direction that the shear force is acting. Do you guys see that? So, so in all of these cases, we actually have three equations that we're trying to solve simultaneously. Um, so actually, I'm just gonna go ahead and write this out so that we can talk through it. Oops. these out for you because it's... Is it standard notation to write FB and not FI? Um, not necessarily. I, FB would just be a, a body force right. in that direction, and I don't know why I put FB here as just being a little more generic. FI is just... More explicit. What, what are the directions that are right. associated with that? So it's probably better to write the FI for X, the capital XI is what we were using on Tuesday. Um, and actually, probably what I should have done on this wouldn't is gonna. Whoops. Wouldn't each of these be like plus F one, and then the next one plus F, F yes. two? Mm -hmm. okay. Exactly, which I'm just doing right now. So I just saw that that's that's a better way to write it. Um, so um, this first one we're gonna do is this. You have to dig it in there. The cylinder with just a stress applied in this x3 direction. Um, and I'm probably not going to, well, I'll try to write these up as we go, but you guys have that to write. So this is just this one, sigma 3, 3. And for now on these sides, I'm going to say this is a free surface. Um, so, the way you 
approach these, and hopefully you guys have had a chance to look through some examples in the notes, but you just start listing what assumptions you have. Um, and that can start telling you which terms are either zero or maybe you don't know yet what they are. Um, so if we have a free surface, what does that what, what does that tell us about the stress on that surface? There is none. There is none. And is that true for both normal and shear, or is it just that there's no normal? Should be for both, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's for both. So it does mean that there's no there's no normal and there's no shear. So with that, what can we do here? Which ones can we cross out? Assuming we have a sigma or sorry. Uh, two and the one, sigma twos and sigma one. Direction. Yeah, if we if we know that sigma one two is on that, so we don't have any shear in this direction. We don't have any shear in this direction. We don't have any shear um, in this direction. We don't have any shear in this direction. So pretty much, we can cross <coughs> out all of our shear. Um, when you write this down in a problem, you want to write down free surface, and you want to tell me that you know that that means 1, 2 equals sigma 1, 3 equals, you know, just write out all the components of stress that you know are 0, so that I know that that's what you specifically know are 0 com as compared to knowing that the, um, the the x's are zero. So we also said that this means the normal stresses are zero. I should switch colors here. Um, okay, so our shears are all zero. Every time I accidentally hit the bottom of the screen, it's pausing. Be careful. Um, we said the normal stresses were also zero. So that's the sigma two and the sigma one term. So we can get rid of the sigma one term, we can get rid of the sigma two term. Um, Basically, so right now, did we, we actually, did we apply, have we talked about applying a, a body force in this one yet? No, I didn't specify here. Um, so depending on your situation, you may or may not feel like the gravitational force is important. Um, in this case, we're going to start out with it, they're not being the gravity. So we'll just. And here you can see already that by our other assumptions, the gravity, basically the body force in the F1 and the F2 direction kind of has to be zero, the way we've set up this problem. So we've already, we can assume that it's zero, but we also have just shown that it has to be zero if our other assumptions are correct. Um, this F3 is the only one where we're consciously saying, yes, gravity is zero, so we're going to get rid of that. So what are we left with? Uh, I, I miss why did you say gravity is zero? Just for this, for this, for for this case. Problem, yep, we're yeah. going to make okay. that assumption. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. We're God in this case. Yep. No, that's God good. Of gravity. Um, Sigma so theory is constant. Yeah. Sigma 3, 3 is a constant, right. So now we've got a nice solvable <coughs> equation. We can integrate. Sigma 3, 3 is a constant. Um, that's saying that it has to be a constant all the way through this, the material in this direction. Um, how do we decide then what the value of sigma 3, 3 is? Not a trick question. Take a real world Where's measurement. So yeah, in some Stress. case we might we might take the road resonant. I also told you that there is a sigma three three applied to the top and bottom. Mm. So that's our boundary condition, right? So we've got sigma three three. So we've decided that sigma three three is a constant. To figure out what that constant is, we can follow that constant value all the way to a known point. And our known point here is what what we've decided is on our boundary. So that's our applied force. So it equals our given force. We might measure it if we have a measurement. Usually that means we measure it on the boundary or something like that. But this is where we bring in 
those boundary conditions, in this case we have one boundary condition that we helps us figure out what that C is. Um, so what makes this goes much more smoothly, and so you don't make mistakes along the way, is that you actually go through those steps carefully. Even if it seems easy to just say, oh, well, then sigma 3, 3 is our answer. If you don't consciously think, okay, sigma 3, 3 is a constant, and I know it's that constant because I know what it is on the boundary, I know what it is at this one point, then, you know, you might, there's, you can make mistakes if you try to jump too many steps ahead of yourself. So, so I really like to see you guys work through these, even if they seem simple, work through the steps of saying, yes, it's a constant, okay, what is the constant? Um, well, then what happens? Is this thing deforming? What else? What do we need to know to figure that out? The properties of the material. The properties of the material. Um, yes. So now we have our body. We're applying our sigma 3, 3. Um, our stress tensor, sigma ij, we've just figured out is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, negative sigma 3, 3, because it's a compressive stress, the way I drew these arrows. Um, I mean, it's bulging in the middle. So it's probably bulging um, because we put no stress on the sides. <coughs> Um, how do we figure that out? How much is it bulging? Yeah. Let's think about uh, our conservation of, just conceptually think about the conservation of mass. If you did take a cylinder and you squeezed it in one dimension by a certain amount, say, delta L, so we squeeze it by a little bit, delta L. How much do you expect it to bulge out on the sides? <coughs> Proportional yeah. delta L, depending on the geometry of the shape. So it's a circle. Is it going to bulge out delta L in each direction? No. No, no less okay. than delta L. But our stresses here are zero, so how do we figure out how much it's bulging. If we have zero stress, how do we relate zero stress to a, a finite amount of strain that we know should be there? Oh, it, um, it will be negative uh, stresses. No, that doesn't make sense. So, so what would this, so if we know that it's squeezing down our strain so let's let's estimate our. What we so think. assuming the it's we not get the pipe is not propo, propo, uh, giving an opposite force to the uh, opposite stress. Are we is that the assumption? Yeah. So we assumed it was a free surface. So it's free to do whatever it wants. It's got no stress. Nothing is holding it in. Okay. Right. Because that is another another version of the Actually assumption. Actually, it is a. Like. There is an expansive stress. So there will, it is yeah, there pushing will be. out. There is an expansive stress. Right. But we just said it was zero. So anybody dig in uh, their memory we what they read in the notes? Does anyone remember the, there, there is a stress that's causing that deformation, but how do we get that stress from this stress? There's another, a slightly different name for it. Do you guys? Does it start with D? Yes. Deviatoric stress? Deviatoric stress. So the deviatoric stress is what's doing the work. What we figured out was the total stress. Does anyone remember the relationship between the deviatoric stress and the total stress? We didn't actually go through this in detail in class, so I thought we were like this one. Something like one half parentheses. Oh, you're going, you're, you're, you're going towards the strain, getting, connecting it with the strain, which is... It's like the stress without shear. Those are the principal stresses. 
but it's slightly different. So the deviatoric stress, the symbol is tau. And it's equal to the total stress minus something. Minus Thank the you. principal. No. No. It's basically minus sort of a, an average stress. Because remember, you were bringing this up before that it's the differences in stresses that cause deformation, mm -hmm. not necessarily just the total stresses. Yeah, that's what. But that's what I was thinking when I said principal. I was thinking lambda. Uh, because right, that, this is not lambda. This is P for pressure. But uh, at that time, the delta is what I was thinking of. Oh, yeah, the, the delta. Yes. The diagonal. The diagonal, yeah. So. That's what I was saying, principal. Right. Yeah, so it's in, that, it's in that equation as well. So, yeah, you guys are remembering all sorts of bits of this, but this is why I, I kind of wanted to go through this. So, so basically what we're saying is that what's causing the deformation is not the overall total stress, but it's the stress <coughs> that's different than the average stress over the whole thing. Um, and that average stress is basically our pressure. The pressure is the trace of the stress tensor divided by three, so that's an average stress. But you're, so I'm interested from why are we subtracting specifically the trace and add the rest of the stress on the matrix? Uh, and uh, why is only the, <coughs> why are you going for the trace is what I'm, I, I feel like I'm close to thinking and understanding that yeah. component, but I'm So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So do you guys remember what the invariants of the stress tensor are? Or of any tensor? What are the first the first one? The first one is the trace. Right. So the trace is the same no matter how you rotate it. Right. The trace is also those normal stresses. Right. And so what we're interested in, we can Whatever stress tensor I give you, I can rotate it around such that there are always zeros mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so you can always find the principal directions, which right. is what you are thinking about. Basically, this is also the sum of the principal, or one third the sum of the principal stresses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you could say this is lambda one plus lambda two plus lambda three. Right. Um, so even if there were shears over here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the trace should still be the same as in the case where there are zeros there. It's just a different rotation. I understand. So, so that's, so this trace version, the one third of the trace mm -hmm. is a version of a pressure. It's sort of an average pressure that gives us um, an invariant that doesn't depend on the orientation that we're looking and if we subtract that out it gives us the stress that's actually doing the work. This is like your swimming pool if it's just sitting there the pressure at any point is just the pressure mm -hmm. and there's no movement but if you tilt the surface of the swimming pool there will be a difference, a slight difference in the stress tensor from point A to point B, but the def the movement doesn't really, it depends more on that difference in the stress at those points than on the actual pressure term that you might feel if you were in the swimming pool. So it's the tilt that's driving the flow of a lake and turning it into a river, basically. So. So we're always going to be, when we want to know deformations, we always are going to look to this deviatoric stress. Sometimes we can get there directly. Sometimes we need to go to this first 
and then subtract out the pressure. And so the neg that will always be negative, right? Um, uh, oh, I don't know what is it. I mean not necessarily. No. It might be. It's it's always going to be. So so our so this stress tau is always going to have some relationship with our strain or our strain rate, mm -hmm. depending on the material properties. Um, in this case, we squeezed it vertically, so that is negative, mm -hmm. but we have a positive DV torque stress in this direction. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily always negative, because we have to have what's causing the thing to bulge is an outward deviatoric stress that's pushing that material outward. Um, oh, because oh, because actually those eigenvalues are actually zero is what we defined it initially, no? Uh, here they're zero, zero. And gamma one, gamma two, gamma three are zero. Uh, so in no, this particular uh, case, two, let's walk through it the rest of the way here. So what is our P here? P equals the trace, negative sigma 3, 3 divided by 3. So if we subtract P, our tau equals 0 minus sigma 3, 3 over 3, 0, oops, 0 minus a it's negative, sorry. It's plus. So plus and then zero plus sigma three three over three. And here we have sigma three three minus oh minus sigma three three plus sigma three three over three. That's all scribbled in there. which means that our tau equals sigma 3, 3. I'm just going to call it sigma, because <laughs> I'm tired of writing threes. Sigma over 3, sigma over 3, and negative 2 thirds sigma. Sigma on the top there. Oh, sorry, sigma on the top. <laughs> do, you guys, do you guys see that? Mm -hmm. So now if I tell you that this um, What well, this means, the sum of the invariant for this case means that it's not going anywhere, right? Right, so the, the trace of the deviatoric stress tensor will always be zero. <coughs> Meaning nothing is moving anywhere as a sum. As a sum. Right. Right. Conservation of mass. mass, continuity in the strain and the strain rate tensors. And actually, the if conservation this trace momentum yeah. is always zero, and our tau is related to strain or strain rate under normal circumstances. The traces of the strain and strain rate tensor are always zero. And that's our conservation of mass that we derived the other day. And momentum, no? Is that well, conservation of momentum oh, is, okay. is, this, is this whole system that we got there. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, now we have tau ij is equal to sigma over 3, sigma over 3, negative sigma, negative 2 thirds. 2 sigma over 3. If the strain is equal to some elasticity times the stress. You could figure out what the strains are, right? Pretty easy. Our strain rate tensor is going to be E sigma over 3, E sigma over 3, and negative And that, so this is double, so if you squeeze it by delta L, then you're going to get half that in each direction. So you squeeze it and not delta L in this way, you get half bulging out that way and half bulging out this way. 
in the stream version, not in the net total length version, because that's all relative. Because if you have a longer one, so if you have a really long one, you squeeze it by a certain fixed amount, that gets spread out over the whole thing, so your actual L change might be tiny, but the strain will be, because this is smaller. Right, so the delta L over L, if you have a long L this way and a short L this way, then your delta L in this direction, it's the strain that's half. Um, so if we say this is in the one direction, and that equals that the strain is not equal to. In the other direction, delta L2 over L2 is equal to one half of this. If we have a little tiny L2, then our delta L2 is also going to be really tiny, but it's still going to be half of this ratio. So this isn't, this, this doesn't tell you the absolute change in the size. It tells you the relative change in the size, because that mass is, ex is spread out over the entire length of our, of our tube. Does that make sense? So the negative sign means it is getting smaller two times compared to the... Yes, it's extending outwards. Extending outwards. Yes. This is assuming an elastic material that whose density <coughs> does not change in the process. And, and uh, the object orientation is a cylinder. Like, how do we determine the one and two directions? Does it involve with the sine and cosine? It's, well, it's going to end up, Cause it's, it's going to be, be symmetric all the way around. So if the one and the two are the same, then you can, it'll be, they're all principal directions, so they all have the same. You already gave the orientation by saying that the top and the bottom is C3, so. Right, so then the one and the two, that it might actually get spread out a little differently if when it's cylindrical. If it was a box, yeah, it's easier to yeah. think of. Yeah. What? yeah, it does get distributed a little bit differently as a cylinder. That's right. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Wouldn't it be even for a cylinder? It'll be even all the way around. But yeah, but you have, you know, corners that you would have to account for in the cylinder because it's just like, it's okay. all yeah. round. Yeah. It's not just. Side to side, side to side. We we would end up converting this to cylindrical coordinates. Right. Yeah. 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 So we would end up with that. Yeah. Anyway. The same idea, but we would just be doing it cylindrical coordinates, and I'd have to think about whether or not the we'd still be conserving mass in the end. You say it might not be that ratio? Or well, the, the right. amount, the actual amount, it should be, I can't remember if it's still E sigma over 3 if we're doing it cylindrically symmetric. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up and forget. Um, it's close, though, but the same concept applies. You can write these equations in cylindrical coordinates and get there directly. Um, so if we have a material, this is where you get into some cool material properties. Um, if you have a material that doesn't, that has uh, what's called a, a, the Poisson's ratio actually is about kind of how it effectively changes density under situations like this. But, because um, right now we're conserving mass assuming density is constant. Um, but there are materials for which you squeeze it in one direction and it doesn't exactly volume wise it doesn't stay the exact same and um, a good one there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of them out there I mean if it's foam or something that has like squishable properties you can end up with a different amount of net strain because 
because you're, not, you're conserving mass, not necessarily volume in some of these cases. And there's actually some materials like fresh fallen snow, if you squeeze it in one direction, it actually has a tendency to squeeze itself in horizontally because of the way the snow crystals are, are trying to, they're interacting between each other. So it has what we call a negative Poisson's ratio. Um, this has a Poisson's ratio of one half, meaning we squeeze it this way and it bulges one half in the other two directions. Um, <coughs> a, uh, a cork in a wine bottle has fun is another funky material where it's got a little bit different one. When you, sh when you shear it, so if you t twist it, it sucks itself in, which is why they use it for wine bottles. And actually, I think if you compress it, it also sucks itself in. So you can get it back in the wine bottle. Like, try doing what we just did, this cork-shaped thing, and getting it back into a wine bottle. I could bring some wine, and we could <laughs> test this out. <laughs> yes, we could do some testing of different materials. Tuesday, we're going to have some <laughs> in-class uh, So it's the properties guys. of the cork, or it's the air? It's the air. It's the properties of the cork, the material cork. So if, we, if you just did what we did, you try to stick this back mm. into the cork, into the wine bottle, you push, it bulges out. Yeah, I've attempted this. This doesn't it's work. It's not going to go. Turn it upside down, it goes back in. <laughs> I see it. So you guys Student know. Student problem coming on with uh, the added mass of the um, of your uh, your opener. Yes, the yeah, added mass of the opener. <laughs> as well as the stresses of twisting. A little bit of, yeah. So this is why cork is a popular material and why it's not so easy to find materials. Because we can get a cork back into a wine bottle. If you just chose a random material, you might be able to get it out of the bottle, but you won't be able to get back in. It's also why twisting makes it, if you, those ones that you, you, you twist in, and then if you try to pull straight up, it's a lot harder than if you give it a little twist while you pull up. You just wiggle, because just wiggle, 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 come on. <laughs> no, I tell you, try the twist. Twisting, yeah. no, that's genius. Try the twist. Because if you just pull up, cork is the exact opposite in the sense of you, if you squeeze it, 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 and if you twist it, it narrows itself down, but if you pull straight up, it actually bulges out a little bit, which is why it's so hard to get them out by simply pulling. But what did you learn in geophysics today? Well, how to open <laughs> wine <laughs> easier open and how to close up. it again to preserve. <laughs> it, it, it's so in, not intuitive. It's a good day in geophysics. Uh, this, this concept. Is why materials are so cool. Material properties are just cool. Non non normal linear material properties. Slightly okay. unrelated. So in your notes, you said uh, near the bottom there was this. Uh, melting silly putty looking thing that you said we could do in class if we want to. Oh, we should do that. That's yes, it looks like it was melting-ish though. Did you heat it up or is that how that? No, if you just set silly putty. Oh, it'll just slowly. Okay, so that's what it was. All right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can go grab some silly putty. I can give you some to watch next week. Okay, so um, the second one is actually, um, well, actually, really quickly, I just want to do one more thing with this version. So we made the free surface assumption that Ale brought up the point that what if it's not a free surface? What if we have something holding it in? Uh, then we know what is the, we, we know what, uh, Sigma two two force would actually be to make the system. How would you find it? You actually just the same. We know what pressure is being. We don't know. So I give you sigma three three. I only tell you how much is being applied at the surface. But it all, and then I just tell you that it's not changing its shape. But you know, it's a uh, two thirds is applied to the side. So in order for the system to be in equilibrium, you need to have two thirds from the outside in. Right, but can you work through that from the beginning? What are you doing in that case? Are you saying sigma one one also has a? Yeah. Okay, I was just Some, making sure. But we yeah. Don't know. yeah. I give you. We don't know. Yeah, what yeah. These I was just are. making sure that you're pushing it on all sides. You're assuming there's the nothing. Forming. There's it's zero. It goes the what whole path. What is it we're assuming? 
I'm just trying to, you're right. I'm just trying to get you to state we're, it more explicitly. What is it we're making, we're assuming that? We're assuming the walls are not prevent, putting any pressure back into the, into the. And how can you write that mathematically? Uh, sigma 2, 2 and sigma 1, 1 are equal to zero. No. What do you say? Say again what you're saying. Because the walls are exerting, is uh, not are not exerting any pressure into the cylinder, or well, into the box. No, I, t I tell you that the thing isn't deforming in that direction. So okay. Oh, I see. It's so I, don't mean, know how I, 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 I see. So I don't know how much stress to apply. So so that you are saying the opposite forces are equal. That's what you're heading. You're trying to get to. Uh, no, I just told you that that it's not deforming. I mean, so at time zero, the opposite of four so equal to zero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody jump in and help? So the wall is not moving. What is our what's our mathematical assumption there? Uh, is it negative three three? That there's no change in sigma two two. Wouldn't it have to be so opposite I give you of the stress here. This is our yeah, sigma three. The stress three. is divided between sigma one one and oh, two yeah. two, right? Yes. So but what's our assumption on the wall? I'm telling you it's not deforming. How can you write that down mathematically? Strain equals zero. Strain equals zero. Uh, sigma one one equals yeah, sigma okay. two two equals zero. I was thinking for yes. Yeah. So I was thinking, jumping, I was thinking into stress. But yeah, yes, yeah. you're jumping ahead. And this is why okay. this is why I want you to go through these steps carefully. So yeah. the assumption here is that we don't know what the stress is, but we do know that it's not deforming, which tells us that these components of our strain tensor. So we kind of have to work from both directions. Because before we just did is we started with the stress and we said, okay, we know what our stress is here. And we'll, I gave you sigma 3, 3. We decided, and you could walk through this by canceling out all of those equations. We actually don't know what sigma 2, 2 and sigma <coughs> 1, 1 are in this case. These are question marks. We might be able to say, that their derivatives are zero, mm -hmm. but we don't know their values. So in order to connect this with this, what do we need to do now? Excuse me, are you using the same uh, coordinate system, like 1, 1, 2, 2? Yeah, this is supposed to be a 3, 3. It's yeah. just poorly written. Yeah. OK. So 1, one yeah. 2, 3. Same coordinate system, same everything, except now I tell you that the sides, they're no longer a free surface. I'm telling you that they're not deforming at all. So it's not deforming in what direction? I mean, like in upside down or? Oh, I need to. Except the top. The oh, sigma except three, the top. Three, sigma 3-3 three, three is still there. Same, okay. same, same. It's just the sides are fixed and they're not Okay, deforming. so it's not deforming. Yeah. Um, do we... Do we know if the density is changing? Is that still constant yeah, in this case? Yeah, density is still constant. Did we say anywhere here that the uh, strain on a 3-3 was changing? What did we say about that? We haven't said anything about that. Oh, interesting. So what did we do? So before you had this and you had those zeros in, what, what was the next step we did? Subtract from. The uh, trace, the average, uh, the average trace, right, average which trace. is that pressure, yeah. right? So, so if we take that step and tau i j, our our p is equal to oh sigma one plus sigma two, which are unknown values, plus our sigma. Let's make this giant Q or something. That's the applied one. That's the one we know. But sigma 1 and sigma 2 are still unknown. So we can still walk through these steps, just keeping those as unknowns. We've decided, if we decide that um, the derivatives of those are zero. So in our original equation, that's here, we could say that the derivatives are zero. 
but we don't know the values. We, so we know they're a constant, we just don't know their values. Um, so our question marks are sigma one, sigma two, they're question marks, but we can say they're a constant. I think that's a pretty good assumption in this mm -hmm. case. Because it's the, sim it's the same material all the way through, it's a nice geometry, and we know that there's nothing really to change it spatially. So we can walk through the same thing we just did, keeping this equation there. So it's hard to all write that all out. But we would, we'd say <coughs> sigma 1 minus RP, sigma 2 minus RP, and then our giant Q minus RP, and this is our known value. Now we can say, well, sigma 1 minus P is equal to our elasticity times sigma 1, 1, but what is sigma 1, 1? I'm sorry, what is epsilon 1, 1? Zero. Zero. So if there's no deformation in this direction, then there's no deviatoric stress. The deviatoric stress always goes with the deformation. That does not say that there's no total stress in the system. It's just the deviatoric stress is zero. If what's the trace of our strain tensor or deviatoric stress tensor? Conservation of mass? Zero. Zero. So if this term is zero because we said this had to be zero. If this term, this term is zero because we said this had to be zero, what does that tell us about what's happening in that third dimension? They're equal. Uh, canceling. They're canceling each other. Yeah. Zero, zero, what does that But Q equals to P, okay. is what you're saying. You keep jumping ahead, like three steps. Are you pointing at it? I'm pointing at it. What is what is that value of that Q minus P? What does that equal? Uh, oh, it, it equals zero. It equals zero. Yes, then Q equals P. So okay. You just <laughs> your brain's working too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so if these have to be zero, then this has to be zero. And what does that tell us about deformation in that third dimension? Zero. It's zero. So if we are conserving mass, we are not having density change, we're not allowing it to expand in that third dimension, then even though we're applying a stress to the top, it's not deforming. So it's dv torque stress is zero in that case. We can still have this overall total stress, it's just not doing anything. Typically, uh, I would say typically your tube is not doesn't have the the it cannot apply the same stress across the entire uh, tube, so that's why it'll have the bulging in the center, right? Um, well, in this idealized case, we are applying the same stress at the top and bottom. Well, I'm saying the sides. So typically, the sides are not. If you had a typical ca tin can. In the real world, yes, you would end up with a bulge that looks like this because of edge effects here. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need to say infinite uh, so you could, yes, cylinder. So you can, and that's one of our other problems here is. Um, is the squared version that I wrote up. Um, where I said the edges are far, far away. Yeah. They land far, far away. Hmm. Um, okay. So do you, does this, is this starting to make sense? So there's a bunch, there are more examples. I just wanted to go through this first one really slowly. It took us, it took us a while. Hopefully that was useful. So you can have assumptions that are the stress value, you can have assumptions that are the stress gradients, you can have assumptions that are the strains, you can have assumptions that are the strain rates, 
You can have assumptions that are the velocities if it's a fluid that's moving. So, um, so you're, and, and these are, those are often boundary conditions or assumptions about simplified geometry or infinite geometry. You can make these, make these kind of assumptions. Um, so the next one I want you guys each to just kind of jot down. We're gonna do this one, it looks like this. Is there a difference between page three and four? Is it for the same? This is not Wait. page four. Yeah, this is not page four. four. But That's four page eight. Page eight. Yeah, page eight. eight. Okay. So here I told you that the edges are far away, and uh, I also want to tell you that actually rather than sigma 3, 3 as a constant, I'm going to change it and make it graphic. So sigma 3, 3 is just is there, but it's in that direction, but it's gravity of being applied. So top so and bottom? The top. Sigma three three is is un, unknown. I mean, it's yeah. You could say that it's only being applied to the top, but it's it's just gravity being applied. Okay. And this is on some fixed and edges far away. Um, you would say it's sigma g over the surface area at the top of the box, right? Because g is uh, acceleration. Um. Or how do you? G is. And acceleration, the gravity, the force, then ends up being the mass times the acceleration. Right. But then the stress would be divided by the area of the surface of the box. Is that how you would? Um, well, this so the body, f this body force, mm -hmm. um, is already in dimensions of pressure, of stress gradients. So. Hmm. It's a we so typically do this in force in I, I guess maybe I missed. We would typically do this in newtons and not in we're doing in this in, in pressure. So the units of this equation, what are the units of the first part of this equation? Yeah. Uh, What's the unit of a stress gradient? I would think it would be under pressure. That's what I well, pressure and stress have the same units. Uh, what, is, what are the units of a pressure gradient? Spatial pressure gradient. It's pressure divided by uh, the length. Uh, pressure divided, divided by, by a distance. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so it's. Yeah. Yeah. Pascal. Yeah. Pascals per meter. Per meter. Right. Um, so it's. Mm -hmm. And all of these are. At a. I mean, this is a force. I mean, we use it as a body force. Right. We have our mass, which is really the integral of the density, um, but we got rid of the integral. Right, right. So this is more like a volume <coughs> force acting at a point. Yeah. But um, but if you figure out uh, density, the units of density times acceleration, I, you get back to My this. mistake, I was thinking of the surface instead of volume. But, uh, my, OK, I yeah, see the so picture. Yeah, so this is acting through the yeah, 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 of course. So, so just start making some notes for yourself on what assumptions you want to make. And I'm actually going to run. I'm going to get some of that so we can do some things. Mm -hmm. about the edges and the boundaries what's the, there, like what's the difference between free surface and just assuming they're really far away she made the like assumption earlier now she's just more explicit i think well like do they act the same way as a free surface like is it going to be zero like i think it's free surface yeah like okay so it's free to regardless expand. of if they're far away what's there it's far away. In, 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 the fact that it's far away that means that the it is a free surface yeah. it yeah. still reacts 
Okay. The different when it when it's, when it's far away it means that that all that surface is going to expand the same. If they were close, it would expand differently. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter too much because right. strain is uh, not dependent on. And that P or rho there, she said that's mass. That's density, density times gravity. Okay. Yeah, which, huh. So let's go. A lot of putty. Okay. Assumption. Um, Annie, what's one assumption that you think we should make? Uh, uniform density. Uniform density. Good. Rho is a constant. Joshua. Can I say it's a free surface? As the assumption. What's the free surface? So there is no normal no shear forces along the, the one and two uh, sides? Uh, well, but we said edges are far, far away. So what, do we know that it's a free surface or not? Mm. What if that free surface is a million miles away? Does that help us much? Yeah. Or the... Sorry. The... The strain in the three dimen in the uh, in the in the direction three is zero because it's okay. So we can say that the top has free surface. That we so know. the top has. Free surface. So there's a free surface at the top. So, yeah. so that means sigma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I put. It had, it had that written on there, right? The one, two, and three. Mm. It only has no. three. Oh, it only has three. Mm -hmm. um, I made it this way, one, two, and three. It doesn't matter. It just ends up changing your math when you look at the. Um. But anyway, sigma three, three is zero because it's a free surface. Mm -hmm. What else? Free, so we have no normal stress at the top. And what else for free surface? No shear forces. No shear forces. So <coughs> sigma one, three, one, three. Uh. and. You mean three one? 
And 3, 1, because they're equal, so there's symmetry okay. there. Okay, and 2, 3. Sigma 2, 3. And what yeah. is it, does it tell us anything about, does that free surface tell us anything about the 1, 2 direction? Yeah. Or the 1, 2 shear? It is not zero. Yeah, not zero. We don't. It doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't, it doesn't give us any information because that yeah. the free surface is only the three surface. Mm -hmm. So we can only say something about threes when we say that that's a free surface. So we're going to get rid of this. Get rid of this. Get rid of <coughs> this. What's the exact I'm definition of free for surface? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Go uh, We're going to do this in two steps. Because what that is telling us that this is true at x3 equals 0. So it only tells us what those stresses are on that boundary. So the definition of free surface is it's... It has no normal and no shear on that surface, which might just be at that point. So do we know yet if, if it's a free surface here, does that really, what does that tell us about what's happening at the bottom? Is it also zero at the bottom with gravity? No. Do we know that? No, because we know that there's a gravitational stress inside there, so we know that it can't be zero. In the other, so this is, this is a boundary condition that we'll keep this in mind. We're not sure what it's going to get us yet. And if we combine it with some other assumptions, we might then be able to do a little bit more. So gravity doesn't mm. affect the top of this little cube thing here. Yeah, there's so nothing... Well, there's no, it's air pressure. Yeah. And so you could put air pressure in there. But yeah, gravity won't affect the top. Gotcha. Because there's nothing above it to yeah. push down for the gravity to be, to be working on. Um, How about the bottom, the bottom of the silly body? The bottom, the bottom is the sitting on oh, a this. table. Hmm. What do we know about that? Well, the, the gravity is pushing it down because it has masses. It has mass. So, so we consider at the bottom. <laughs> we could say. What yeah. Would you say uh, some stress like? And what, what would be the? Do you know what the magnitude of that stress is? Uh, the the force divided by the area. So it's well, for gravitational stress at depth. You guys just did this in here. Oh, the yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we can put that down. It actually will come, that one will come out of our solution as well. Yeah. But the stress at the bottom yeah. is just going to be the weight of the column of the silly putty above it. Oh. But yeah, mind. so we can write these down. Yes. So what's another one? Um, How about the edges far away assumption that I gave you? What is that? How do we? What? Is, what might that tell us mathematically? Are we assuming that the h is a lot smaller than the width? Yeah. So h is much smaller than some l. What what might that tell us about um, what then is happening in that one and the two direction? The deviatoric stress is zero. It's very small. Mm, not necessarily, but what is you're, you're on the right track? If H is much smaller than L and it's the edges are far away and we're considering this a uniform constant density material, 
Um, can we generate any gradients of anything in that? If it's all, if it's infinite going off in that direction, and it's the same from this point to this point, and this point to this point, and this point to this point, cool. and that goes on to infinity. Get a really small number. That tells us that the derivatives, all derivatives in those infinite directions are zero. You can't have infinity if you have some constant, some change in that direction. If it changes okay. in that direction, then it's not infinite because you have stuff happening. But if it's infinite in that direction, then your gradients in that direction are zero. Mathematically, you can divide by infinity. That's what, we, that's what we're saying. We're saying we divide by infinity, and therefore the and value is small. Zero. Zero. Yeah. Is it actually well, considered zero? zero? Okay. Oh. <laughs> One divided by infinity would be zero. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by edges? Like, is that these edges or these edges? Because oh yeah yeah okay it's Good. not clear yes right? no it's not clear <laughs> I meant the sides oh the, so it's flat it becomes like okay I mean we're we're basically doing the silly putty but the edges the sides are far far away the sides are far far away okay, okay. the next That's problem should be the silly putty concept no, <laughs> <or> <laughs> do. so so now with this I can be like okay that's something I can do something with right now. I see this, I can go through and say, okay, all derivatives in these two directions are zero. Yay, get rid of that, 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 get rid of that. Done, that makes me happy. Because I just got rid of a bunch of stuff. Um, The next assumption I want to, I think that we could make. What do, well, what do you think? The body forces in the F1 and F2 directions are zero. Good. That's a very good one. <laughs> so, so assumption yeah. five is F1 I equals F2 is zero. Why? Is that gravity? Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Just testing you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so now we're down to a few equations. It's looking a little more manageable. Um, can we say? We said here that sigma three three at the bottom is rho g h. Is there anything we can say about these? I mean, it's supposed to be just, um, huh? Wait, sorry, which, those two? I'm just, I'm going around in the circle. Okay. Okay. Well, um, we can say that um, those, or we can we can put it back into our into our equation. We know that um, then the partial derivative of sigma um, one, three with respect to three, and two, three with respect to three are both um, equal to zero, because the force there is equal to zero, so putting the, the um, the, the derivative sigma are equal to zero. Yeah, the yeah. derivative of sigma plus f. Then. So what does that tell us about the value of this? So it at least has to be constant. So it has to be constant. And any ideas on what could help us figure out the value of that? So if it has to be constant. So it, um, it also has to be 1, 3, and 2, 3 have to be equal to 3, 1, and um, 3, 2, respectively. Right, so yeah, these have to be equal. But here we also but we only we knew that the derivative was constant, so that doesn't help yeah. us know that the value, what the value is. Um, um, so this is the stress in. Yeah, the um, there's no. This direction or this direction. Yeah, there are no forces yeah. acting yeah. any way other than down in the in the vertically. So there's no um, there's no shear forces happening in the edges or any weird oddities might occur are very far away, so we're not really worried about those in our Exactly. Setup. So, so in this case, we do have this nice geometry, stuff is far away. We're not applying any shear forces 
to the boundaries. So there's no way for, if we're not applying any shear forces to the boundaries, and the, those shear forces, this is telling us they have to be constant, that kind of implies that there are no shear forces then, so those have to be zero. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, we already uh, made the assumption that number two, like uh, the shear one, three, and two, three is already zero because of the free surface. Right, because the free surface on the third, the third free surface is zero. Yeah, so that's, that connects it straight to, like that's saying that we're not applying the shear. Yeah. Yep. So we can refer back to this one and say, hey, this is zero. Therefore, these have to be zero, too. Um, so we're left with this guy, F3 is negative rho g. This is where I always, I think that's positive rho g, actually, the way this is written. So at the top on number two, actually, you also had yeah. sigma 3, 3 equals zero. Did yeah. Is that just sigma three three equals zero? Where? Just is it just at the top then? So at the bottom. The free surface is just at the top, and so the that bottom. only exists at the top. The reason this applied is because we said that this derivative had to be zero, which meant that sigma one three is a constant everywhere. Sigma one three is a constant everywhere. We know it at one point. So therefore, we know its value here, and we know that it's constant everywhere, which means that we know its value everywhere now. Sigma 3, 3, we know that it's zero at the surface. But we don't know its value everywhere, and we, all we know is that this relationship tells us what its, what its derivative is. Do you see the difference yeah. there? Mm, yeah. So you have to remember that a boundary condition is just that at the boundary. Um, and you have to apply it. So, yeah. uh, no, sorry. I mean, oh, um, so the derivative of 3, 3 is equal um, on x3 is equal to rho g, and we can integrate along x3. So this is so sigma 3, 3 now equals negative rho g x3 plus c. I, um, you could do a, uh, you could define like um, some like height which is down from the surface and do a um, definite integral and say it's equal to minus rho g h. So yeah, so sigma or 3, 3 little h. at, at x equals zero, because the way I, this is part of the reason I had drawn the zero in or my box is solve it for like that. Yeah. So this is the three. One, two, three, and in, in the box that I had when I did this on my scribbles. The reason that I did that meant that we know that sigma three three is zero at x equals zero. And yes, then we can say that x three We have some h, so x3, so we can also then say sigma 3, 3 at x equals h is equal to rho g h, and we can replace that x3 by the equation um, that x3 equals, well, x in the case that I, because I started at 0 and went down, from 0 to h. Um, but if we want to know it at any point, then we do want to keep the x3 in there because it's only the integral if we're going to go all the way, we're integrating it all the way through. So, so our sigma ij now equals 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, negative rho g x3 plus c. But since we've decided that it's a free surface at the top, that c is zero. If we were also applying a stress at the top, then we can add that in 
and then our C would not be zero. I'll just get rid of this. So we have a nice equation for sigma now, or a nice tensor for sigma now. Um, what are, we can now do the same. take, go do the same process with our sigmas, figure out the tau, the deviatoric stress, and our strain rates, in this case it's more of a fluid because it's our silly putty. Um, and there are two assumptions that we can the same like the, with the last one, we can have two assumptions in the in this in this dimension. So we already know it's infinite, but our two assumptions are one to allow gravitational spreading. So even though the the sides the, the sides are far away, we can still say well they're far away, but they still can spread out farther, and that's what's happening here. Um, so if we allow for gravitational spreading, what does that look like mathematically? And then our other option is no gravitational spreading. If we allow for gravitational spreading, so. That'd be a Do we have to know the material to know whether it's viscous or elastic? This one we'll say is viscous. But so okay. yeah, we do, and that's why I put the strain rate here. But you could do the same thing with an elastic. Okay. If you wanted to go elastic. Um, um, so what was the assumption we just made about allowing for deformation of our blob sideways in the last problem. You said that there was no deformation. Well, no. the first time we did it, right. we said that it was a free surface on those sides, right. right? And that told us that the stress was zero. So, and we said Actually, that the strain was zero. Hmm? And then we sa she said that the strain was zero. That was in the second one. Yeah, right. the second one. So the second one where we, we allowed no deformation in that horizontal, right. we said the strain was zero. Mm -hmm. Are we not saying it for this one? Well, we have not two yet. assumptions. We can either allow for gravitational spreading or we can not allow gravitational spreading. Okay. So if we don't allow gravitational spreading, that's like yes. the second one. Okay. So here, if we don't allow gravitational spreading, we're going to say that our strain rates have to be zero. Mm -hmm. And I should go back because we actually don't know all of these. I, I want to be clear on this. I wrote it this way, and that was in haste, and this is why I should be very careful in the future. Um, from our assumptions, we figured this one out. We actually did not necessarily figure the, these out. We did decide there were zero shear stresses. Mm -hmm. So we're back to this case where we have question marks here right. and we just know this. Okay? So now our decision is either no gravitational spreading, which means there's no strain rate. And if there's no strain rate, um, then we have to have no deviatoric stresses. So there's no deformation happening, which means that the total stress tensor is there, it's just not doing anything. So it's, there is no trace of our, sh of our deviatoric stress tensor. If we allow for gravitational spreading, 
that is actually saying that the 1, 1 and the 2, 2 are 0. Here we're saying that 1, 1, 2, 2 equals question mark. But we're saying that epsilon dot 1, 1 equals epsilon dot 2, 2 equals 0. This is that assumption we're making. So it's the same assumption as we made before when we were holding our thing in. Um, so no gravitational spreading. Here, if there, we're allowing gravitational spreading, we're saying that there is no, no stress, external stress kind of being applied to hold everything together. So this, these stresses are zero, but that means that we have to have some deviatoric stress to balance our sigma 3, 3. Because the trace of this ends up being zero, just to conserve mass, if it's because we assumed also the density was zero. So this is where these values might be different, but their traces have to be zero to conserve mass. This is what we know. So it, again, you can go in multiple directions, but in both cases, you can fill in the blanks with just a little bit of math. Does that make sense? So, um, The rest of these problems are pretty similar. I'm going to put a couple of them we have my notes on because we're running out of time. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the, just want to kind of review our common assumptions. So free surface we've talked a lot about. And that's no normal or shear on that surface at that point. Two, we also talked about density or other material properties being constant. So that's a good one. Three, we talked about infinite in some directions. And if it's infinite in that direction, that means that the derivatives it's infinite in the x1 direction, all the derivatives in the x1 direction have to be zero, because that means there's no change happening. No change in that direction. It doesn't tell us about the magnitudes in that direction. It just tells us that there's no change in that direction. Um, what else? Um, a general one is that if you're not, under most geometries, if you're not applying a shear stress, it's kind of hard to generate shear within a system. Like gravity doesn't really generate shears in a system if, um, in a system like this because gravity, unless you've got some, something else going on. So you can often say if you don't have shear of being applied at the edges and the geometry is simple enough that it's hard to, it's hard to generate shears inside. Um, I mean, it's hard to generate shears under certain conditions. You can um, in some places. Uh, and I should take that back. Gravity does apply in one direction, but there are cases where you can generate shears with gravity. I just lied. Um, did we, were there any others that we came up with? Body forces. Yeah, we might assume something about the body forces, the direction, the magnitude. Um, and then five, if we, if we have a known stress at the boundary, or known
strain or strain rate. So that's another one that we know. Um, you have to be careful with these that you're not jumping to conclusions because you think that it has no strain rate. So you want to be careful to just figure out what you really know versus what you think is probably happening. Um, then the other ones that I Wait, really sorry, what was that conditional? You said if there's a known stress at the boundary or a known strain, then... So if you really do know it... Okay, then there so is... So if you know you're strain. applying a certain magnitude, then yes. Or if you know that it's not deforming in that dimension, yes. But if you just are like, well, it seems like it's not shouldn't be deforming in that dimension, I would say don't jump to that yet. You always want to hold off and make as few assumptions as possible as you work through and see if you can solve it without that next assumption. So as you cross these off, you'll get to the point of like, well, can I solve this given what I have in front of me now? And if it's a simple enough equation that you just have to integrate, then there's no reason to jump to that next conclusion. You might be right, your instinct might be right, but you should be careful of applying instinctive boundary conditions versus ones that you actually know. Um, a few others that we didn't quite get to in these examples. With fluids in particular, the no slip boundary condition, what that's saying is that a particular boundary can have a normal force, so you can have a normal stress, but you can't, um, I'm sorry, you can have a nor you have normal stress and your, your shear stress will prevent any motion. Um, so so you, this d isn't necessarily saying anything about the normal. You can still have regular normal stresses on this, but, but your shear stress means that your velocity there is zero. So this actually isn't, the no slip isn't always a stress condition. It's a velocity condition. So, so it's just saying like it's pushing against velocity in like the opposite direction of the velocity of whatever is there. Yeah, so it's, it's reacting to that motion. And this is very, it's the reason that water is still at the edges of rivers. It's a very common, like in general we assume that when a fluid hits a solid, the molecules closest to the boundary stick to the boundary. Um, and so the, the velocity right there at the boundary is zero. You could also have the opposite, and that's a slippery boundary. So this is subtly, this one is subtly different than a free surface where it can still have a normal stress, but all shear stresses have to be zero. You may not know the velocity at that boundary, but you do know that the shear stresses are zero. So would that mean that in the two examples we've done this year, there were slippery boundaries? Um, Since our shear stress was zero, or does that not? Yes. So we did have slippery boundaries. We did at the bottom of our, the one that we were allowing. If we allowed... But like, so a free surface is, would not be considered the same thing as a slippery boundary. It's a free surface is slippery boundary with an extra no normal stress. Oh, okay. Because you could say that between the air and the fluid, yeah. it's a slippery boundary. Yeah, okay. Um, and those were the most common ones, actually. Um, when you get to having 
some fluid flowing down a slope, your gravity is going to show up in two different equations. <coughs> so there's a component of gravity in the downward. Um, and this is like number three. Yeah, this is page three. In this one, it actually is not, it's almost like what we just did, but all we're doing is tilting it. So a lot of the same assumptions apply, we're tilting it, and therefore gravity will show up in two of our equations instead of just one. Um, so, and a lot, like I said, a lot of these are, are worked out in, um, in your notes. And for example, the no slip with a fluid flowing down a slope will end up, this, the velocity will end up being curved like this. And depending on your situation, <coughs> the strain rate is usually constant through there. Um, and you have a curved, a curved velocity. This is where we get the, the, the square that we had the river flow before I told you that. Um, but this is all worked out in your notes. So if you remember <coughs> what we've talked about today, we've just gone to the point of the strain rates. But then our strain rates are related to our velocities because the velocity in the one direction Oops, x2. But the velocities, the strain rates are derivatives of the velocities. And then, nicely, what you are remembering is for a shear strain rate, so if we do have a velocity as a boundary condition, we sort of have to walk through is that a fume hood alarm? That's probably the, the test. test for today. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it says they were going to test yeah. today. I guess we're probably failing the emergency test. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So shut them out. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, you can have, if you have velocity boundary conditions, you have to kind of keep that unknown into your equation all the way through until you get to velocities. Then you stick in what you know. And then you can work backwards as you need to to get back to stresses or velocities. Does that make sense? It's probably the alarm system thing too. <laughs> yeah, everything uh, is. It's yeah. always probably um, So several more of these are walked through in the notes. There's two, at least two more complicated ones in the videos from last year. Um, but it's the same process, and you just sort of carefully walk through them step by step. I think it is the emergency system. Yeah, I didn't, didn't call. I didn't know that they called people. You need some text. Yeah, I need yeah, to get text. They sent text too. I, see, at my undergrad, you had to sign up for this. You couldn't. They didn't just automatically. Facebook send gave them the information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were just like, oh, we're gonna sign you up. I had one question about the um, the computing assignment. Real quick, in the um, you're asking us to um, find just sort of like take estimated values for like stress and uh, viscosity and things. You also wanted a um, an estimated idea for strain um, in the Earth, at least um, in the, the relaxation model. It was. Um, I was wondering what like I was trying to just think of a good like. <laughs> Trying to figure out what um, you know, um, a value of what strain a in one dimension that's sort of like just to help define our function. Well, think about uh, you know plate tectonic deformations that you know are out there. Um, um, 
because that is a a strain, or there's a there's a movement. Okay, because the values we've been we had been giving were more like in the mantle. Um, so look up, look up look up how how fast things flow in the mantle. Google is not always so. Useful. Is it? And this is what I was talking with Matt about. So if we're looking at how fast something's moving in the mantle, is that not a strain rate? Um, that could be a strain rate, yes. Um, but you but can, we can use that. So value. you could also. I mean, there's a. The mantle has both elastic and viscous, and I'm kind of leaving this. Like, there's a lot of different ways you, you can look at the strain rates in the mantle. You can look at like lithospheric deformation. Um, I mean, I don't know that I told you to only look in the mantle. Um, no, you just said well, give when it's estimates of Earth. For, Earth, Earth, like for the Earth. But the only things we can find are mantle values, really, it seems. Mantle values, so there's yeah. nothing about lithospheric deformation in the papers. And I'm sure there's some researchers. I'm not, you know, you can look farther than Google. <laughs> there is such a thing as journal articles and stuff if you really want to. Um, and you might have to go to Google Scholar. And yeah, that's what look I've been looking the, at is Google Scholar. Look into the papers um, and look, you know, like there are, what happens in an earthquake? What are, um, you know, the last time the San Andreas Fault went, what were some of the stresses going on? What was the strain? Um, was there a net strain? So there's a lot of different ways you can look at Earth-like values. Just come up with a consistent set of values. So given this particular situation, I expect stresses around here, the elasticity of the crust is this, and I expect some strains or strain rates in these particular things. So either mantle, crust, kind of ice, I mean, I asked you to find ice, I think, separately, but, um, but yeah, so. so <coughs>